Yes, so uh, um, good morning and good to see everyone uh, that's here. Um, and uh, I want to start by thanking our hosts for, for the organization of the conference and uh, also especially to the, to, the, um, to the ones, the organizing committee who has uh, put together a program. I think it's uh, very well done in terms of how the themes are uh, progressing through the, the conference and I'm very happy to be here today uh, when we have already heard a lot of great presentations who has actually been foreshadowing mine, my theme um, very much so, so thanks for that. Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Lisa uh, and uh, I'm new to the COST network, but I hope to be seeing more of you in the coming year and years um, and to, to collaborate with you uh, as good as I can. Uh, my background is uh, as a librarian and information scientist. Um, so my research interest is very much uh, how, uh, how to keep information and how to find the information and under, uh, understand the information that we keep, and especially then research information. Uh, so in practice, that very much means that I look at how data is wrapped up in different genres uh, and presented in ways that others accept as uh, knowledge or as a product to, to be put in an archive. Uh, and my talk here today will connect to the conference topic presentations uh, and uh, reception of archaeological knowledge. And the talk will be based uh, partly on my PhD thesis, which is uh, openly available through the Uppsala University online archive. Um, but also very much from uh, on observations from my work as a research documentation coordinator at a large biomedical uh, university. And I will also touch a little bit on forthcoming research within the capture project that I know that Isto will, will talk more about uh, after my presentation. Uh, so, as I started preparing this keynote a few weeks ago, I uh, thought, uh, oh my, that's uh, really an ambitious title. Uh, what was I thinking about? Um, but as I started to, to uh, think back on the last year and the, the spring, um, when, I, when I wrote this abstract, uh, the abstract for the for the keynote, uh, I started to remember what I uh, had in mind. Uh, so during this uh, this uh, past year, uh, I worked as a research documentation coordinator at a biomedical university, uh, and this was an administrative position. So. Uh, I was teaching and meeting with the researchers. Uh, Um, and talking to them about how they could uh, go about to fulfill their requirements with regards to, to how to present and store and make available their, their work. Uh, so I would go out to their clinics or to uh, their labs or their offices or wherever they were working. Uh, and uh, I met, during this time, I met so many people, either furious or uh, delighted about the possibilities slash requirements to, to harmonize their presentations of their work, um, their data, uh, according to certain standards and systems. Uh, sometimes they were furious and delighted at the same time. They couldn't really separate the feelings, uh, but uh, 
this was really much of what my work was about, to meet these people with their feelings about their data and to try to uh, help them find a way to, to uh, make the best out of it. Uh, and this didn't just take a lot of time, but it also took a lot of energy and uh, a lot of my, my, my intellectual focus, so to say. Uh, so these uh, encounters made a big impact on how I, how I view things today. Uh, but this, this uh, said, uh, this background given, uh, I promise to, to narrow the scope a little bit today. And um, this is really the core of what I want to talk about with you. Uh, decision-making in presentations of data. Uh, and uh, decision-making in uh, presentations of research data, as we have already, or as previous researchers here, uh, previous speakers here at the conference have already uh, touched upon, uh, happens daily and uh, all the time. Um, I refer to decisions both being taken through conscious uh, discussions with peers uh, and in communication with fellow researchers uh, in the wider research community uh, through collaborations and networks, for example. Uh, networks such as this, for example. Uh, but also uh, decisions about how to present data taken by people with other professions uh, and at other places within research organizations and outside of research organizations. And when I say this, I refer to, to people such as uh, university management, uh, IT departments and administrative staff, such as uh, um, myself when I worked at the medical university, uh, by documentation and data management software providers, uh, and by publishing corporations asking researchers to present their data in a certain way uh, in connection to publication. Uh, so I want to point to here uh, a multitude of, of uh, actors involved in this decision making. Um, so the reason that I bring this up uh, in this keynote uh, is that I think it's an important conversation to, to uh, have in the connection to, to uh, uh, all these in-depth discussions of, of uh, data presentation that we have already listened to. Um, because what I observe is that um, the decisions about how to present data today uh, often involves, on top of involving the individual researcher, it often involves also representations of researchers in different forms. And that might be uh, representation, uh, rep representatives, representatives of uh, researchers from different departments um, forming a focus group for, for a university, or it might be a group of administrators meeting with, with the software developers uh, and I do not say that decisions taken uh, by representatives for researchers are uh, by default uh, less, uh, less well thought through or less, uh, less good. But uh, what I observe is that the individual researcher's decision is very much uh, embedded in a larger uh, context of decisions taken by others and at other places within and outside the research organization. So to 
engage in this conversation with you and to hopefully spark your interest uh, in these questions. Uh, I'm going to make a comparison of, two, of the state of art in two cases of research, uh, one of which will be uh, Swedish development-led archaeology, um, and one of which will be uh, university-wide information management at um, a university, the biomedical university with, where I worked. Uh, so uh, this comparison, uh, of course, is a little bit like comparing apples to oranges. But the point is uh, that it makes us see a little bit about what is particular about the one archaeological way of doing things and what happens uh, elsewhere uh, within um, research information infrastructures. And uh, also, uh, this comparison will serve as a ground for us to discuss a little bit uh, which challenges uh, may come, uh, may archaeology come to share with, with other research disciplines in the near or uh, a little bit further future. Uh, so I hope to, to expand your interest and uh, knowledge about uh, the organization and administration of research documentation and research data uh, management. And towards the end of my talk, I will also take the chance to, to pose some slightly, perhaps slightly provocative questions about the, uh, the role of research data when the infrastructures around the data are expanding. Uh, so stay awake until then. Um, yes. Uh, because I know that we are from a little bit different areas here, uh, from different disciplines, uh, I just want to show you real quick, uh, a little bit of the terminology that I'm using in my work. Um, so when I say data, I refer to whatever a researcher collects. Uh, data management are the uh, very much practical actions taken to uh, clean, format, migrate, uh, mark up, store data sets, uh, data or data sets. And documentation, I know that this can be a um, uh, term used in different ways, but I refer to uh, wherever you explain the research process. Uh, and this is including, but not limited to explain whatever data you have collected uh, and how you have managed it. Uh, presentations of data more, is a more narrow term in my terminology. Uh, so, presentations of data uh, take place in different genres and formats uh, tailored to data presentation. And today I'll refer to two of those uh, formats, um, which is one is the report, and the other one is information management systems tailored to data presentations. Uh, and I added also the term paradata because whether, whether I like it or not, this is a term that I will be working with in the f coming uh, five years. Uh, and paradata uh, today, for me, refers to, to the um, hereditary uh, or, and or process information about data sets used to understand and further process uh, data. So the first case then, um, and you don't have to keep what I say in mind because I will present you with neat uh, columns to compare the, these two um, cases as well. Uh, so the first case is based on my thesis. Um, on uh, Swedish development-led archaeology. And uh, I did this uh, research within the project uh, 
archaeological information in the digital society. Uh, and as I started, I was already interested in professionals doing research, so I brought with me this interest into archaeology and started looking at uh, what's called development-led or contract archaeology uh, that you already heard uh, from Delia about a little bit yesterday. Uh, so, um, I looked uh, at the type of archaeology uh, that mainly uh, takes place outside of the academic environment by researchers employed by uh, contract archaeology uh, organizations rather than by academic uh, departments. And uh, uh, instead of looking at the cutting edge or evolving technologies used in this uh, field, uh, because that's another possibility. Uh, I started by looking at what, what was the most common documentation format. Uh, most, uh, as I assumed uh, then, affecting the everyday life of these people. Uh, and it soon uh, became clear that the the report is a central uh, genre for, for carrying out the work in this um, context. Uh, so all archaeologists in Sweden, whenever you're when you have completed a survey or an excavation, you have to submit a report, much like the situation in many other countries. Uh, re these reports rarely contain data, but they are very much used to, to present and interpret uh, whatever data collected. Uh, and the report genre, uh, this is a little detour, but it's, from my perspective, it's also very interesting because it's one of those genres that has uh, sort of resisted the uh, much of what the digitization has brought about. So it has stayed or transited into the digital world very slowly, step by step, and conserved many of the, the documentation practices uh, of the analog format. Uh, and this, uh, as many of you are aware, aware, has caused quite a lot of frustration. Because uh, for for those who hope that digitization would automatically bring uh, significantly improved uh, knowledge transit between different uh, parts of the archaeological domain, uh, the report genre has sort of resisted much of this uh, development. Uh, so the the uh, the actual exchange and communication has taken much longer uh, to develop. Nonetheless, uh, I explain partly why, why reports uh, maintain this central position in my thesis. Uh, and uh, it is still being one of the central uh, genres for presenting uh, in and interpreting um, archaeological data, uh, much of the archaeology that is actually undertaken. Uh, so just to, to uh, go into the thesis a little bit uh, briefly, I did uh, an information policy analysis to, to explore the uh, legislative and regulative framework. I did a uh, citation analysis to, to explore how reports relate to other genres within and outside archaeology. Uh, I did um, uh, an analysis of documentation ideals to see uh, how, how is, um, uh, what's valued in a report, what's considered a good report. Uh, and finally, I did an uh, interview study to see how the archaeologists working in this context relate to 
to the information policy framework, to the documentation ideals, to the, the uh, knowledge infrastructures that they have available. Uh, and this constituted uh, an analysis of the context for the production of this genre. Uh, but today what's interesting is uh, how this um, uh, genre is um, uh, situated in terms of what is it that uh, archaeologists are required to document and which format to use? Who's deciding this? So if we just look very briefly at the regulations, we have the most uh, important regulation um, is the National Heritage uh, Legislation. Uh, there are additional, of course, guidelines and the professional um, good practice guidelines, um, uh, but the National Heritage Legislation is the most, most central. Uh, if we look at the, how this, uh, uh, how the um, um, uh, reports are administrated, uh, we have the uh, National Government Agency, namely the National Heritage Board. Uh, who are issuing guidelines and overseeing that uh, the reports are, um, are um, collected and uh, uh, made accessible. Uh, so the service provider uh, in this situation is also the National Heritage Board. They are setting up the system uh, for uh, making the reports available. Uh, the role of the researcher in this context then becomes uh, the, the archaeologist, the working in development-led archaeology, is delivering a report to uh, the national database. So this chart is simple enough so that, you know, even if this differs from the situation in your country, you can easily sort of, with your imagination, fill in the situation in your country uh, so that you can uh, continue to reflect uh, on this as we go along and compare it with the biomedical um, example that I will give. Uh, so the second case uh, of uh, digital uh, research documentation will then be um, uh, I will take from uh, uh, the time when I worked as a documentation coordinator at this biomedical university uh, and this uh, university uh, they used uh, an university wide information management system for the researchers to do their documentation within. Uh, and uh, giving a little bit of background, uh, the fact that they employed uh, a documentation coordinator to begin with was stemming from two parallel uh, developments, so to say. One was a, trust, a severe trust crisis uh, as a result of a um, uh, paramount misconduct uh, case that was uh, going on for several years. Uh, so the documentation coordinator was sort of uh, one of the cures uh, to restore the trust in the institution. Uh, another parallel development was the more general development that more and more uh, universities uh, and even departments, large departments, uh, nowadays uh, set up data management um, offices, uh, research data offices, they have a little bit different names, but uh, infrastructures of expertise to support researchers in making decisions about uh, data management um, uh, at all different stages throughout the research. 
Uh, so, um, biomed is of course a huge area, but uh, I'll paint in a few broad strokes today uh, to bring us to the comparison and discussion. Uh, so, looking at the uh, the uh, situation in biomed from the perspective of information, uh, to characterize it, we can say that uh, similarly to archaeology, uh, in biomed we have data derived from very different uh, types of research activities, uh, from uh, clinical practice, from uh, uh, epidemiological practice, um, qualitative data in care sciences, um, lab, uh, lab environments. Um, so quite a large variety in the types of data. Uh, also, similarly to archaeology, you know, it's a small term for a big, uh, big um, um, thing, but it's a data-intensive discipline. Uh, studies, you have studies generating huge amounts of uh, image data, for example, spanning over uh, 10 or more years uh, many times. Uh, it's a very collaborative environment. Um, and this is perhaps where it differs a little bit from, from archaeology, uh, because in bi biomed, uh, you have global clusters of research institutions uh, collecting data together and also um, many times in cooperation with corporate uh, partners. Uh, so that might differ a little bit from archaeology. Uh, but again, uh, similarly to archaeology, uh, in biomed you handle a lot of sensitive data. In archaeology, it might be data about uh, locations, as we have, have talked about, or, or uh, artifacts uh, and places of uh, special cultural uh, impact that are sensitive. In biomed, on, on the other hand, we have sensitive, sensitive personal data, uh, but also data about chemical uh, substances and viruses and bacteria, um, also data from animal studies or other types of controversial studies that needs to be protected in different ways. Uh, it's also a very prestigious environment and this is also something that impacts the, the presentation and management of data. Uh, you have the normal institutionalized peer review, uh, but you also have an environment where there are uh, anonymous reviewers um, seeking to detect errors in publications and re reporting these um, errors to editors. Uh, there's, for example, uh, an anonymous uh, reviewer called Claire Francis who has gotten some uh, attention lately. Uh, this is one or more persons uh, working under uh, a pseudonym uh, specialized in detecting errors in image uh, data. Uh, so uh, it might be because of the environment where I worked, but uh, allegations of research misconduct is quite usual. Uh, and it might be that, you know, one allegation of misconduct is met with a counter allegation of misconduct. So the ethical, re um, the review boards, the, the boards who has the, the job to, to investigate these uh, allegations have more than enough to do. Uh, and of course, the documentation of the research processes is their core uh, type of evidence in these processes. And the case is very often that there's not enough uh, evidence. There's not enough evidence to, uh, to declare that someone is guilty, but there's not enough evidence to declare that someone isn't guilty 
either. And this is, of course, a huge uh, problem for the, for the research environments where people are uh, people that has been uh, accused for misconduct are, are often like left in a sort of professional limbo, not entirely accepted, not entirely uh, detached from the research community at large. Um, so this, all these uh, aspects taken together put a very high pressure on the research management, the, uh, the uh, uh, management of the, the uh, institutions, of the universities and the research institutions, to provide solutions uh, when it comes to, uh, to documentation systems, storage and access, uh, both during undertakings and after. And in this, uh, in Biomed, the need of the university uh, management to, to provide these solutions for the researchers uh, make up a very interesting market. Uh, so actors on this market is really selling solutions to a paramount problem. And here I want to show you a short snippet of a movie. Phil, let's see if we can play it from here. No? You'll help me. So this is just one. The amount of scientific data doubles every three years, but scientists mostly still rely on paper notebooks to keep track of their experiments, much like Marie Curie did 100 years ago. However, today most of generated data is digital, and more than 80% of it becomes untraceable, stored on some computer. Introducing SciNote, a modern way to organize your scientific data and safely store it all in one place. Manage your projects, organize your tasks in the workflows, upload results, generate reports for a meeting, and share your data with your peers. You can also write your comments much like you would in a paper notebook. Access your data from anywhere with completely free SciNote Cloud account or install it locally. SciNote is an open source platform so you can create your own modules, choose from a growing number of existing ones, or contact SciNote team and they will develop it for you. SciNote, the easiest way to manage your scientific data. sound wonderful. Who doesn't want to be modern? Um, but this is just to give you one example of what the product on this market looks like. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, there's tons of more videos uh, out there if you, if you want to go deeper into this uh, fantastic world of promises. Um, so uh, this is just uh, to show you a list of, uh, of the number of, uh, of um, uh, solutions, the number of software uh, available uh, in Biomed. This is a list compiled by the Harvard Medical School, um, their data management working group. Uh, so they have compiled an ELN matrix, electronic lab notebook matrix, to, to make comparison uh, more easy. Uh, but this is a very um, dynamic market. Uh, many of these have started, uh, by, was started by researchers uh, as startups. Uh, but it's, it's a, a very lucrative market, so they eventually get backed by uh, venture capital or uh, bought by larger corporations and often in many steps. So it's bought by, you know, a little bit uh, bigger corporation and then by a even bigger and and eventually it's part of a huge uh, offer, um, uh, a combined offer of different software um, packages. Um, so. Uh, Many of these have 
developed from more specialized, targeted to more specialized research environments to, to becoming more generable, uh, gener general, to become more sellable, of course. Uh, and uh, it's also interesting to note that since biomed is uh, very much uh, uh, an area where there is there, there are these um, uh, collaborations with different corporate uh, organizations um, there are for example collaborations with pharmaceutical companies and medical technology um, hygiene and cosmetics uh, so in some cases it's um, it's the case that the the collaborating partner has decided on using one software and they require all researchers collaborating with them to use the same software for their documentation and that's put in you know all contracts uh, so it's really nothing they can uh, choose uh, But as I, I said, it's a highly competitive market. Uh, these companies are, are looking for the uh, large and long-term contracts, of course. And uh, universities uh, often want long-term contracts. And they might be seen as a big partner for a while. Uh, but if the, the company offering the software is bought by an even larger corporation, then what was once uh, a large uh, cost, if the university was once a large customer, then it can uh, suddenly become one of the smaller customers, uh, one of the smaller users of the software. Um, but um, having worked uh, as a documentation coordinator, I have gotten to know a few of these through their marketing uh, strategies. So what they're trying to do is they're targeting a number of prestigious institutions uh, worldwide and try to get a few customers to mention to others so that they can continue to sell their, their product. And uh, if you don't answer your email, they'll seek you out on your social media and uh, try to convince you to, to uh, have lunch, uh, try their services, you know, promote it to, your, to the researchers you, you meet with. So it's a very sort of aggressive uh, marketing environment um, on this market. Um, well, so if we then arrive at the comparison here, uh, where we have the, the uh, archaeological situation on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side uh, you see uh, a little bit of the differences that I want to point to here. Uh, that we have a um, national archive legis legislation regulating the, the university research. Uh, but uh, admin administrating and overseeing that this legislation is followed isn't the, the uh, primarily the uh, national government agency, but the university has the responsibility to do this. And the, um, the university to solve uh, their problem, so to say, they are uh, partnering with these uh, often multinational, multi-business uh, corporations selling these information management solutions. Uh, the role of the researcher here becomes a user of the information management system when doing the documentation. Uh, and uh, the archiving and access becomes, uh, even if it isn't in a legislative uh, legal sense, but it, in fact, it becomes dependent on the information management uh, system, uh, systems format. Uh, so, um, I was uh, a little bit thrilled when, uh, when 
Sakri asked Eric the question yesterday about, you know, how did he choose his uh, software to begin with? And he started to explain, yeah, first it had to do with uh, getting an affordable license, and then it was uh, based on, you know, what a university was offering. And his uh, answer uh, very well illustrates what happens here, because uh, even even before you discover, you know, the agency within the within the technical um, system that you're using, there's a whole level of agency on the the uh, level of how do these uh, software uh, come come into our lives in the first place, uh, and this has to do partly but very little with the with the policy level. It has to do a lot with the management uh, and administration level, so the management of research. Um, so uh, autonomy and harmonization, uh, how does it come in here? So. If we go back then to, to the frustrated researchers that I talked with talked about first, uh, you can easily see how both these formats, both a reporting format and a, a system format, uh, require some degree of harmonization, uh, even if it makes room for, for some individual decision making. Uh, and one interesting feature of the, the groups that I met was that even within the same research group or within uh, the same uh, people working at the same lab, there could be some people in this group really frustrated about the need to harmonize, uh, others who didn't feel it was such a problem. And I thought a lot about, you know, what does this, what's the possible cause? Uh, my analysis, my hunch uh, to, uh, you know, at least a partly, part explanation to this is that it could have to do with the type of research that you're doing. If you're doing a lot of open-ended work, you might be developing your uh, data collection uh, method or even data collection equipment as you go along. Um, and you don't quite know where your where, where your research is leading you. Uh, you you may feel quite a lot of frustration to present your work within these systems uh, that require some degree of narrative. Uh, but this is something that we can talk more about. Uh, the important thing for our discussion today is uh, not how well a researcher's job uh, and efforts can be represented in the system or not, uh, but where the decisions uh, take place and who are involved in, in shaping these, um, these um, the services and systems for presentations of data. So, um, as I as I uh, illustrated. Uh, there is a high pressure on university management to provide solutions for researchers. Uh, and uh, the in infrastructures are expensive to develop for single uh, institutions. Uh, moreover, the expertise to build these infrastructures are scarce, as we have talked about as well. Uh, during coffee breaks, etc. Uh, thus, uh, the market for those who are offering these solutions is uh, very fruitful. And I think that even if you know, even if we won't see the the same situation as we have in biomed, 
it won't uh, transfer uh, into archaeology um, as such, but I think that we can come to see some influences of the, this market on the, the environments within which uh, we as uh, archaeologists and heritage uh, researchers work. Um, and this will, of course, bring new challenges in terms of uh, integration to, to the important aspects of archiving and access that we care so much about. Um, so uh, really, um, what I want to do is to call for a greater interest in the level of management uh, of research uh, on these areas. Uh, and uh, uh, this is really something that uh, you know covers both macro and micro uh, levels as well as some philosophical questions. But these are really the, the questions that I want to, you know, um, that, that I want that you take uh, with you uh, from today's um, talk. Uh, and also, um, since, um, yeah, um, yeah, let's stop there. Let's stop here and uh, I'll say thank you for your attention and uh, if you have questions or comments, I would love to hear, hear them. And uh, I said Paul to you, but your name is Jeremy. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Um, we have a few minutes if anyone has any, any questions for Lisa. Holly, can you remember to name, give your names for the benefit of please? Hi, Ooh, I'm Holly Wright. Um, so I was really, this is a really fascinating talk, and I'm interested in how, um, when you were talking at the beginning about the development-led archaeology reports for the Heritage Board. At the Archaeology Data Service, we have discovered a really interesting phenomenon where, because we uh, now freely disseminate, I think it's over 55,000 development-led uh, and published fieldwork reports from probably 150 different uh, um, companies. And because they're all available in one place and everyone can see each other's reports really easily now, we've seen, and we've not done any sort of you know, data gathering about it, it's all quite anecdotal, but the quality <laughs> of the reports over the years gets better and better and better because everybody's seeing what each other, what the other archaeologists are doing and how they're reporting and, and um, so I'm, I'm interested in, do you think that, that the same thing is going to happen in Sweden? I mean, is that the same, uh, how important do you think that phenomenon is in, in the work that you're doing? Uh, well, um, uh, based on my thesis research, I can say as much as uh, the availability uh, of the, the open reports uh, at least provide grounds for, for uh, archaeologists to compare oneself to others. And uh, sometimes, uh, I guess even in also in Sweden that it ends up, uh, as you say, the, the quality is being raised. But another thing that I saw was that, um, you know, uh, archaeologists use each other's reports to sort of take a standpoint uh, professionally uh, and, and uh, sort of an, like an, you know, uh, I use the term documentation ideals, but it, you can also say like an intellectual standpoint, professional standpoint. So, for example, I had people saying that, okay, so uh, I think that good quality uh, reports should be very brief and condensed, 
uh, that's you know you should convey your your findings in as few words and essentially a few pages as possible uh, while others were saying you know with explicit reference to to others works that well I my opinion my view is that it should be as extensive as possible uh, that's what makes it usable and uh, um, clear so I think that you know you know even if quality is raised the the uh, sort of meaning of quality might differ to to people with different uh, sort of professional uh, uh, ideas uh, But presumably that quality, that conversation wouldn't be happening if people couldn't see each other. So that's really interesting. Yes, Thanks. Yes, yeah. Definitely. So Matt is, and then, and then Zach, I think, had a question. Hi, thank you for the, the talk, Lisa. Um, I have a general question. Um, and that is, you represent data as a very passive kind of resource in a way. Um, so it can be organized and structured in various ways and it's subject to um, various management strategies and the kind of technology that's being used. And somehow it's got all these different kinds of agency acting upon it. But it seems to uh, lack any agency of its own. So I was wondering, is there not a sense in which, or would one not expect the data to be less pliant somehow, in that the real world really does have this capacity to push back against our plans and strategies and things. Uh, and in the sense that our data reflects something of the real world, would we not expect it also to have some kind of resistance to it or, or uh, uh, agency of its own? Um, that's my question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, that, that's one of the very philosophical questions. Um, but I can say that I've seen, you know, perhaps not data having an agency of its own, but data being given agency by strategies of researchers. So when presented, for example, with an required information management system, uh, you know, two researchers working parallel uh, can choose different strategies. One can choose to sort of work the system for their purposes uh, and to push their, you know, their to sort of use it to to present their data in a very efficient way and uh, you know adding all the necessary you know context and links and whatever and one another use uh, another researcher you know in the from an outsider's point of view exact same situation can you know decide that uh, I will, you know, resist using this system, and instead I will go against, uh, you know, uh, the head of the department and choose my own way of presenting things. I will uh, put everything on, uh, onto, you know, uh, um, some open um, network, for example. Uh, so it's it's really, really very much, you know, and and there are in in within the university system at least. In Sweden, there are little, you know, uh, there are a lot of requirements, but there are, you know, rarely punishments for choosing your own way. Uh, so it's very much a matter of how people, like, relate to to uh, having systems imposed upon their work, uh, and this differs very much. And it's very interesting to see how people choose different paths. Question, Zach. Um, this uh, Zach from University of Toronto. Uh, this relates to what you just said, I guess. Um, but 
um, maybe a little bit more focus on, on open source. So I'm wondering, so open source is often touted as a way to like take control of your workflow, of your data set, or how you share it, and or like free yourself from proprietary bindings or whatever licensing aspects. Um, and uh, I'm wondering how open source tools are being adopted, especially with regards to like you know this you know imposition by institutions to adopt certain tools, and whether like what like, if you could maybe I don't is there a certain like unit of uh, like, the, like I, I understand that you know these companies sort of uh, try to attach themselves to an institution, but are people trying to like maybe um, use open source? I see this in like in in, in my own thing, my own uh, uh, as a as a grad student among other people who are very interested in managing their workflows. That people are trying to sort of use their own, conduct their own system, um, and I'm wondering how that sort of fits in and whether. Uh, um, the like this this sort of um, uh, um, ecosystem of open source uh, tools or like, or open formats is 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 sort of having some sort of impact on yeah. Yes, that's a very good question. That again has to do as I you know as I see it with the with the dynamics on this market. Uh, because um, a lot of these uh, companies have, of course, understood that uh, uh, using open source is is a way of selling your product, so that uh, you know researchers at the uh, uh, universities can build their own modules to go with it, uh, etc. While some of these uh, companies, you know, uh, use a proprietary format, you know you can understand that it's specifically to, you know, because they are also selling the modules to go with it. Uh, so it would basically ruin their, you know, entire business model that's, you know, decided somewhere completely uh, different and on a level in the organization which has, may have very little to do with the university uh, environment because they are selling, selling solutions to um, supply chain uh, companies as well, or whatever it may be. Um, so, uh, so it's really, you know, it's really uh, a market where the sort of academic ideals of how to do, how to uh, get the software you need is meeting with a uh, with a different uh, set of ideals for, you know, uh, on the market. Um, so, and this of course depends, you know, which, which uh, company does the university have uh, a contract with and for how long? And what will they put in the uh, requirements when they renew the contract? So though that expertise to know what to require from the companies is, is uh, a key here. And uh, that's, you know, where my point of view is that that's where a lot of the problems come from, because uh, those who uh, write up the contracts are, that's the legal department with little understanding of what's needed in the uh, research reality. 